Kofi Annan, thank you very much for joining me here on Afterwards and the book is Interventions. I'd like to start with perhaps the biggest intervention, mm. the most famous mm. intervention of your time as Secretary General and that's Iraq. It was a very contentious issue. Mm. You spend a lot of time writing about mm. it in the book and you reiterate your thoughts that it was not a legitimate war. You write, if 9-11 changed the world, the consequences of the Iraq war were of a similarly dramatic magnitude. Why do you say that? I, I, I say that because uh, the Iraq war really led to major divisions within the international community. And I'm not just talking about the UN, I'm talking about its impact on communities and groups in the Middle East and beyond in the sense that the world has been broken into groups and some were being targeted or profiled who felt very strongly uh, about this. And this is about a war on which the international community was divided. The council, as you know, did not approve it. Uh, and I personally believed we should have given the inspectors, the, the weapons inspectors, more time to do their work in Iraq and come back with a report to the Security Council for the council that had warned Saddam that if you do not perform, there would be serious consequences to determine firstly whether he has performed, cooperated with the inspectors or not, and secondly, determine what those consequences should be. Uh, obviously, when it comes to use of force, any country when attacked has a right to defend itself. But when it comes to broader peace and security issues, one cannot do it without the unique legitimacy of the Security Council. But why such a lasting legacy? Because now that American troops have pulled out of Iraq, isn't that a war that's done and dusted? Whereas, of course, the, the legacy of extreme Islamic terrorism is with us every day. It is with us every day because, uh, uh, first of all, I wouldn't say the war is dusted and done. The impact on, Ir on Iraq and the Iraqis are rather traumatic. People are being killed in Iraq every day. You know, I was in Iraq uh, in July talking to the Prime Minister. We discussed Syria and he was very concerned about what could happen using their own experience and telling me, but of course, that the war in Iraq energized the jihadists who rushed to Iraq to fight. And I think we are likely to see the same in Syria if we don't handle it properly. So there's still a global impact from there's Iraq? Still a global impact. You start the book with a very revealing story about Colin Powell, mm -hmm. who came to you after the invasion as it looked like Americans might be about to find weapons of mass mm -hmm. destruction. And Mr. Powell said to you, with a big smile on his face, you write, they've made an honest man of me. What did he mean? No, I, 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 can, I can understand that. And I think basically he made the case for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And for a while, we couldn't find anything. And so if they had found it, as he thought they had, it was vindication that finally we found something. And uh, it was uh, more a relief than anything else. Do you think he was used to make a case he didn't believe in? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can say that. But obviously, he had a stature. He had a, a very high reputation and extremely well liked by the international community and all the foreign ministers. And as I has said some time ago, he was a star of the foreign uh, minister. So he had incredible credibility. And do you feel that his presentation to the United Nations, which was so critical in making the Bush administration's case for invading Iraq, was a presentation that was justified? No, I think from what we have seen, there were no uh, w weapons of mass destruction. And I'm not sure that uh, with or without that uh, presentation, the Bush administration wouldn't have gone to war anyway. I think they had decided to go. You're quite pointed in your criticism of America when it comes to the war in Iraq. And you write that the perception of much of the global community was that America was enraged and vengeful. That's, that's correct, in the sense that immediately after 9-11, you would recall, there was incredible outpouring 
of support for the U.S. We have candlelight uh, rallies all around the world. And the I, headline I, in Le Monde newspaper, exactly, we're all Americans. We're all Americans. And I recall uh, not long after that, Newsweek did a, a piece. The title was, Why Do They Hate Us? And I said to Michael Whitaker, who was the editor, I said, Michael, that's the wrong question. The right question would be, we have so many friends. How did we lose them? What happened? You know, but there was a fear that angry superpower US was lashing out. And, and anyone in this way may get into trouble. And people were scared, uh, scared of America, scared of to sit, to speak up and to say what they believe in. And I could see this traveling around the world talking to them, which was unfortunate because the U.S. had done so much to create the U.N., so much for human rights and democracy, and to s suddenly find herself in that situation was an awkward one. I mean, obviously, when we write a book, we choose which mm. sure. anecdotes to put in it, and we choose which words to repeat in it. And the fact that you chose to point out that criticism, albeit from the mm. global community, and use the words enraged and vengeful, is that what you felt America was acting like? Was that what you felt was driving America? L let me put it this way, that they were so determined uh, to take action that I'm not sure they were ready to listen. And they were ready to listen to other views. And, and views from friends as well as from foes. And, uh, and when you are in that situation, you do make mistakes. You do, you do also uh, provoke others. Just in the last few days, Archbishop Desmond Tutu has called for George Bush and Tony Blair to be made to answer to the International Criminal Court in The Hague for lying about weapons of mass destruction. Would you go as far as to support the Archbishop's call? No, I think uh, you know, men in leadership make many decisions. They get some right, they get some wrong, and some decisions are monumental. And the war, the decision to go to in Iraq was a huge, uh, uh, hugely important, and the impact is there for all of us to see. Uh, they obviously have to live with the consequences of those decisions, and history will judge them. Hi history will judge, and uh, I think I would want to leave it at that. They are both uh, men who have done some very positive things in other aspects, both Bush and, and Blair, but they got Iraq wrong, in my judgment. But I think that we should leave history to judge. You don't think there's a case then for the International Criminal Court? I'm not pushing for a case. Uh, and in fact, uh, I don't see a case, uh, and I don't think uh, the court itself would take any action. No, no, I, I wouldn't go that far, no. Reading your chapters on Iraq, I, I kept thinking about what is the role of the Secretary General, no. because you were critical at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder whether you saw your position as that of team doctor or, or of referee in terms of America and the Security Council. I think um, it, it was a bit of both and more than that, because when the organization or the Security Council in particular gets divided, the Secretary General's roles become very tricky. The Secretary General has to keep working to bring the community together, to get them to work together to find a solution. Divisions are normal. It is normal in any human endeavor to have divisions. What is important is to find the leadership, to pull people together, to identify the common interest and move forward to work on them. So as Secretary General, even when you are against an action by a group of member states or a member state and you are c criticizing, yes, you should speak out, but you should also know that you have to remain viable to be able to play the conciliatory role, to be able to play the role of bringing the two sides together after the fight and is over. But that's very tricky. It because as tricky. soon as you speak out, 
exactly. you are forfeiting some of your credit with the people you've criticized. The people you've criticized and they think it's against them. I mean, you sometimes have to explain to them.